before you answer 10 questions on history. So we would like to ask you now about the present and the future of computing. In your opinion, is it possible to tell what are the most important trends in computing nowadays at any level, chip design, system integration, software development, web design, etc., that would have the broadest impact in the immediate or more distant future? Thank you for that nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today, remotely at least from my office here in Harriman, Utah. You asked in your question about what we're seeing in terms of important trends in computing nowadays that will influence web design and chip design and circuit design and other types of things. One of the things that really comes to the fore there is ease of use. The tools that people provide that allow engineers to do web design, that allow them to do chip design, uh, design FPGAs and other types of devices into products really make the difference. Devices these days are incredibly complicated and if the tools don't keep pace, people really are going to be left behind. There's a group of financial analysts on Wall Street that have used FPGAs in some type of computer system, perhaps off the shelf PC, to do financial calculations. They did their programs and algorithms in C. They dropped them into an FPGA, which runs financial calculations at extremely high speeds for them. And they must be doing massive numbers of calculations. But they were able to do that just by mastering C or C++ and knowing the financial algorithms that they wanted to apply. So that speaks a lot to the way that tools have been getting easier to use. You also look at Microsoft's .NET software package that's come out recently for embedded systems programmers that's now becoming a lot easier to use in the embedded world on small processors. It's a real boon to people who want to concentrate on solving a problem rather than becoming real program experts. That's not to detract from the programming experts and the experts who know all the ins and outs of FPGAs, but the tools and their usefulness and their simplicity open up these types of devices and software techniques to people who might not be real experts in the field. We're hearing people talk about biocomputing, neurocomputing, etc. Does it make sense from an engineering standpoint? Good question about neurocomputing and biocomputing and uh, I hear about those things too and you certainly can read about them in the popular literature as, as well as in some of the research journals. I guess really the jury is out on those just as it was in the early days of silicon. Uh, we weren't quite sure where we were going with silicon technology back in the 40s and 50s. But people persevered and they figured out what to do with it and figured out how to use it and at first it had niche markets in applications with the telephone companies at that time in transistor radios and transistor amplifiers and that type of device that was meant for consumer applications. So we'll probably see biocomputing and neurocomputing take the same path. Uh, people will develop interesting applications for them that can do things that perhaps we couldn't do as easily or as well using other types of computing elements. And they'll work on it, and then they'll do more research, and they'll find interesting things. Uh, at this point, I'm not sure that there are practical uses for it, but it's interesting, and it's certainly worth following and keeping an eye on. As you see new technologies coming out, do you still like to jump in and work with them? Oh, you bet I like to jump in on new technologies. Whenever I see an advertisement in a magazine or a news item for a new device, a new processor of some sort. I want to find out if they've got a development kit or a demonstration board or something that I can sit here and work at my lab bench on and try it out. Companies do send me equipment from time to time to review and uh, now that I'm writing with ECN Magazine we've got a column in there, books and kits in which I review not only books but some of these development kits as well. I wish I had more room. They're just a lot of fun to fool with. I've got one here on my desk and I've been looking at this one. It's a nice one that's got all kinds of uh, peripherals and things on it. Unfortunately, the thing I find with a lot of these development kits is that the documentation isn't very good. Companies come out with lots of features on these boards, but they don't really document them very well. 
so that the people who want to experiment with them have no recourse but to go on to something else. Uh, sometimes the information is cryptic and it's difficult for people to jump in and actually get something to work. I had one case recently where somebody took people through an exercise on, on, on a kit and they got to a certain point and they said, okay, now it's up to you to figure out the last step. I don't think that's a very good teaching tool, but uh, people do silly things like that. I also like to look at the types of kits and things that kids would be interested in. And I've been experimenting with one that I've got here too. It's called a Bobot and it comes from Parallax. It's a nice servo controlled little robot that has two wheels that are propelled and it's got a microcontroller unit on it. It's just great for kids to learn about robotics and electronics and programming and the company has a nice manual that goes with it that provides about 50 hours of self-paced instruction for students. So that's the kind of thing I like to fool with. I've got a lab bench set up and really enjoy spending some time on it. They're only 24 hours in a day though, so I have to kind of pick and choose the types of projects I'd like to work on.